Okay, so um, can you hear me clearly? I hope my voice is loud enough. Uh, welcome to uh, the unit Modeling and Simulation 2. My name is uh, Charlie Wang. I'm the unit lead of this uh, unit. And welcome to this unit. I hope this is a very uh, useful unit for you to complete your future project and also your coursework and also our individual projects and also the following courses. And then the major thing of this uh, unit is trying to build up the connection between uh, numerical computing and the physical law what you learn and give you a first taste about how to really use in this kind of a computational power in the simulation and how this is going to help you uh, to supervise your future design and how you are able to uh, build more advanced design and how this is going to be Im improved. And so we have a huge uh, cohort of students. So I, I hope everyone could arrive the whole on time. Otherwise, it's quite annoying because uh, I cannot control my talk myself to uh, stop looking at the door when you come in. And then so uh, I hope everybody comes on time next time. OK. And so first of all, let's introduce the lectures of uh, this unit. We have two lectures myself and also uh, Dr. A.J. Harish. So basically, the unit is going to cover both the final element analysis part and the computational fluid dynamics. And uh, A.J.'s expertise is in uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics as well as solid mechanics, the computational part of solid mechanics. So A.J. is very good at both parts. Myself, I do uh, many design manufacturing and simulation and also a little bit about CFD. So uh, I will coordinate the whole unit. And the lecture, there are total eight weeks of lectures. Every week we are trying to cover the content within two hours. So of course, uh, we are trying to not use the full two hours as a whole, but uh, we are trying to deliver as much as we can within the window of uh, two hours. And then week one, two, and four is going to be covered by me. And I have uh, some uh, business trip in week three. So AJ is quite kind to help me to cover the week three of this uh, unit. And then the second part, computational fluid dynamics, is going to be fully covered by AJ. So these are two lectures of this unit. And I hope this is uh, very important information to understand. What is the distribution of the workload of this unit? So basically, there's no assignment, no final examination. Okay, you're happy or not? If I'm a student, I will not be happy because it's kind of uh, out of my control in some of sense. But uh, we are trying to make it as specific as possible for the coursework. So don't scare too much. And so basically, we have two coursework. Each of them is going to cover 50% of the final score. And then FEA part, the course words is going to uh, deliver, I think, if my memory is correct, the last day of week four and with the deadline 10 days later. Okay? So CFD was similar. Okay? So basically, everything we hope can be finished before the 2nd of May or the latest, the 4th of May. So it turns out for other units, you, uh, if you have some final examinations, the coursework of other units, we are trying to uh, somehow give you more time to spend the other units. But before that, please try to be focused on this unit as long as you have enough time. Okay? And then we're going to have uh, six laboratories in total. So if you're checking your timetable, I hope you already see it on your timetable. So everyone will starting from week two, every week you have two hours of laboratory. So basically in the PC lab. So it's a software oriented course. So basically you are using the software during the laboratory and also you're able to uh, kind of uh, finish. There's kind of a lab sheet for you to finish. And then also we're going to have some of the lab sheets ask you to finish at home, so remotely or using your own software. There's already some question asked me about, could I install the software on my Mac? 
laptop. Unfortunately, no. Even myself, I have not solved it yet. I'm trying to install a dual operation system on my Mac, Mac computer, unfortunately, because this is a university computer that they don't give me the administrative level control, so it's kind of a challenge. So trying to use it in the PC lab, I mean PC clusters as much as possible. If you don't have your Windows laptop in your hand, which is able to install the software offer, like remaining using ANSYS, I will come back to this a little bit later. So you, you now understand what is, the, what is the current setup of the assessment scheme of this unit, right? Any questions? If no, I will go ahead. So it's basically what a software is going to use. I hope you already learned a little bit about MATLAB, although myself personally is not a big fan of MATLAB. And we have a big plan of this uh, department trying to kind of fade out lab lab, uh, MATLAB in the future, trying to use more Python instead of uh, MATLAB. But uh, you know that takes time, so we are trying to introduce this kind of change starting from next year, not this year. So this year we're still trying to use MATLAB as much as we can because you go through those uh, year one course, you learn a little bit about MATLAB, how to use MATLAB to code, the linear system, I suppose you're able to do that, right? Okay, and this is also going to be practiced further in this unit because the really calculation part of a final element analysis is really solving a linear system, so that's it. <laughs> And then, so you're going to use in MATLAB, you're going to using another software as ANSYS. So it's pretty much you are able to uh, download the ANSYS student version and install it on your Windows-based laptop, okay? For those who are using, as what I mentioned earlier, for those who are using Mac laptop, you probably have difficult to install this software on your, on your laptop unless you are a super hacker and you're able to do that and, and then that is possible but uh, personally as I mentioned I've not figured out how to do it yet. Okay. And both the say FEA part and the CFD part is going to use in uh, ANSYS. So one part is based on solid mechanics simulation, the other part is uh, based on the uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics simulation module of this uh, software. Okay. And then the teaching method, we kind of, uh, you know, let's say uh, eight hours to cover FEA, in my opinion, is almost not possible. So we're trying to using, uh, trying to using the video as much as possible. So every week before you come to a lecture, we already introduce some of the brief introduction video, put it online, the blackboard. So trying to uh, cover all those videos before you come to the lecture. Okay, that's very important because uh, two hours, we need to focus on the most important part of the content instead of uh, go everything into detail that's not possible to be covered by eight hours, okay? So before I joined this university, I taught uh, finite analysis for more than 15 years. So basically my course of FEA is covered 40 hours lectures, okay? So that is, if you want to formulate everything in details, you need 40 hours to cover the whole FEA instead of eight hours. So this is already a light version, okay, of FEA. And I'm trying to use in a video as much as possible, so it turns out you are still able to capture those, uh, say, main content of the FEA within this eight hours plus another, like, eight hours, for example. So every week before you come to this lecture, trying to allocate one to two hours to cover those uh, pre-lecture video, okay? So that's very important. And then the other part of this uh, unit is very essential part is trying to use the software, okay? Trying to make yourself very familiar with the software. Although the lab is only have two hours, but I'm pretty sure you need to spend more than two hours Try to make yourself master the software in detail and everything. So trying to allocate another two hours to prepare for the lab or post the lab. So it turns out you're able to still catch up the whole the progress. Don't wait until you go to the coursework. Okay, that, that is already too late. Okay, trying to allocate every week, try to allocate the two hours for the lab section, another two hours 
for the pre-lecture section. So basically, besides of the lecture time two hours, lab time two hours, every week trying to allocate another four hours to cover all those rest of content. I think that is a very essential part for your learning cycle, trying to uh, cover all the content, okay? And then the computer tutorial is actually the lab sections. Everybody is assigned to one of these three groups. And then we have a relative large GTA team to help you during the, the lab section. So you already received the email from our GTA lead, right? I, I, if you don't check in your email, I already receive it. And then so basically we have a four GTA lead. Two of them is taking care about those uh, finite analysis section. The other two is taking care about the CFD part. Okay. And the other thing is very, very important because we have more than 450 students. Although unfortunately here, I, I roughly count we only have around 200 students here, it's not that many. So I suppose half of them are hiding themselves somewhere and then trying to catch up by the video. But we have 450 students in the whole unit. So each lab section will have around 150 students. Okay. So it's a huge amount of students. Don't expect that your email will be response in a very quick way. So unfortunately, we cannot. Because, so try to using those uh, discussion board as much as possible because if that is used as also benefit other students of your peers, then then there are some of the quite, a lot of uh, quite common questions and the problems. We hope that can be uh, well organized and discussed during the discussion board. Okay, so but also you're welcome to send me email if there's some special, really, really special case, okay? You need me to help you to really go through. And then I will try to push whatever our, our teaching support team or the laboratory team, or even I can directly talk with the department head. I, there's some advantage. I'm in the same office as our department head. So it's basically we're trying to, uh, we, I can help you in that sense, but if that is, that only happens if it's a very, very special case, okay? So, and then that is uh, something I would like to introduce before we really go into the detail, the content of uh, this unit, okay? Any questions? I hope it's clear enough, right? Okay, and then we'll go into the, this is a timetable. I hope it's uh, big enough, you can see it even those of you who sit in the last line of the lecture theater. And then we, because this semester is kind of, uh, kind of started quite early compared to the previous years, right? So our Easter comes uh, between week eight and week nine. So you see a, a big gap there, okay? And that introduced a lot of uh, challenge for the CFD part because after two weeks, if you don't really keep using it, I guess like uh, three weeks later, probably some of the thing you already learned in the first week you already forgot. So I think it's, uh, it's better if you can shift some of the, the practice, especially the software usage during the Easter break, okay? Don't really completely drop it off and then you know that after that, we are going to release the coursework. I think, look at that. The coursework of, of uh, CFD is going to be released on uh, April 17th, okay? It's due on May 1st. So, and then Easter is summertime. You, you, you should consider how to use it, okay? It's just some suggestion. Of course, you should say, okay, I'm good at using software. And I, I don't worry about it, and just go ahead to enjoy yourself during the Easter break, okay? And then that's, uh, that's the really management. So trying to check in your timetable after today's lecture, trying to make sure that one of these three sections, okay, you can check in week one, uh, week two, sorry. It's like if one of these three sections already on your timetable, and you should be good enough. And then 
the rest should be already there. But if you, did, if you didn't see any of them on the timetable, try to let us know. Okay? There must be some mistake from their, their PS support team. Okay? So that is, uh, that is uh, the current time arrangement of this unit. I hope we can keep doing that, but unfortunately, sometimes there's uh, uh, something is not well controlled, like if you know, like there's uh, quite a few days, uh, some of the university strike, right? Yeah, I, ha I, have the, I have the photo with us. It's like, they suggest around 16 working days during April and March, there was a university strike on, that, on those 16 working days. And uh, myself, I will be here, okay? So if it overlap with any of this, and I hope our GTA will still be there, but it's not in our control, okay? If this thing happens, and we will try to make up some of the special section, okay? So for those, if you, some of this uh, unpredicted thing happens in any of these, uh, especially the lab sections, I'm pretty sure the, the, the lecture session should be fine, okay? Both the AJ and me will be here and do introduced content, okay? I hope that will help solving the problem, okay? Right. If no other questions, I will go further. So that's good? Okay, so let's come back to the to real content. The first thing is like, this is unit is called modeling and simulation. And are the different thing or are they the same thing? So it's basically, myself feel like simulation itself is actually a modeling. Right? So although it's a core modeling and a simulation, this is because we're trying to highlight the computational part of the simulation. So it's basically, modeling and the simulations are talking about how you're going using computer, trying to help you solving a physical problem by using mathematical formula. So that is the basic idea of simulation and modeling. So that's what I show on this graph. This is basically a black box, okay? There's some input, and then we're trying to using we're trying to use in the, the software to give you some output as the black box. Okay, but the, only knowing this black box is not good enough because this is otherwise you feel like it's a kind of bag, uh, garbage in and garbage out thing, right? So, but it's not. It's something really. Oh, it's quite annoying. I forgot. What's that? It's something that's really related to what you learned from those previous courses and the future courses. For example, if you're trying to solve in solid mechanics problems, you pretty much are solving a partial differential equation, which is governed the elasticity problems. And if you're trying to solve CFD as Navier-Stokes equations, so this must be some physical equation there. So the key issue here is like how you're able to convert. What's that? Sorry, sir. Is something I can control? Uh, what is that? Should I should I do something or here or there? Let me make it. Let's make it simple. Yes. Can anybody help me? Let's make it simple. Just turn it off. Okay. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know it's recorded. Yes. You're asking whether it's recorded or is it's because of recording to have this uh, noise? Wow, that scares me. <laughs> I, I select automatic recording as a preference. I'm not sure, I suppose someone's recording it for us, so I hope this happens, okay, right. Is that something turned on there or? Wow. Selection, what happens with this? Should I do something here or? Eh.
No, I, I didn't. I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything I should do here. Okay, come on. Okay, please be quiet. Okay, I'm. Uh, so last year is automatically recorded. I don't need to do anything here. So basically, you can go there to check in. There's a video there, and it's completely recorded. Even the, some of the secret questions during the break is recorded there. So, and I hope this will continue this year the same. Okay. And then what is uh, what are the very important part of this? Simulation and modeling, because there is another nowadays another type of a simulator. It's called data-driven simulator. So basically, artificial intelligence is a kind of a data-driven simulator. I mean, the general artificial intelligence or those are fundamental part of AI. It's a data-driven simulator. So it's basically, it's, that's the real garbage in, garbage out. So it's like, uh, if you whatever data, they just learn from this data and try to predict according to the pattern which is embedded into that data. Okay. But if the computational physics, what we are going to introduce here is slightly different. It's that we are really using a physics-based, or it's called a model-based simulator. So you have the governing equation, which is derived from those uh, physics laws, and then trying to supervise the simulator to give you the answer according to the physical computation. So that is just different. So we are going to cover this model-based method by using computational physics to solving the simulation problems. Okay. So that's a good, right? Now I come to the first part of our simulation modeling two. I, I have no idea why it's called modeling simulation two. Do you have simulation modeling one? No. no. I, yeah. I don't have this. I also have this curiosity. And then you're also going to have simulation modeling three next year. And then where's the one? I think it's, it's, it's embedded into some other courses, OK? So you, you, took, you took the course of Milan, right? Numerical computation. Did you? This semester. I, I hope it's not today, it's tomorrow or something like that. Yeah, so and then that, that is a part of that is really simulation modeling one. Okay, so this helps you to solve linear equations by computer program, how to do the interpolation, but that is somehow again is related to our final element analysis. This is because if you're looking at the real part of a final element analysis, what is called finite element? From the name, you feel uh, yes. Right. Great. Cool. That means that you already watched those uh, pre-lecture video carefully. I'm happy to see that. Okay. I hope some others also learn from him. Okay. So this is very important, like because you have limited resources, you cannot go to those atomic level trying to solve the physical problem. No, you cannot do that. So you need to do a certain level of simplification, or we call coarsening, and trying to make things not that detailed, but still giving a certain level of accuracy. Okay? So you're using limited number of these so-called computational elements. So that's what is called final element analysis. Okay? But what happens inside of each of these final elements you still need to have a continuous representation to describe what really continues happened inside of each element. So it's basically, it's not a constant inside of this particular element. It's not like you're taking digital photo. If you go to each pixel, every pixel is a kind of a constant, right? Constant color. So what is the drawback of this? If you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in of these pixels, and then you see basically a kind of, uh, whether it's a circular dots or, or a square with constant color. That's introduced a certain level of you know, artificial boundaries of those. For example, 
there's a sharp line between this color and this color. And then if you zoom in, zoom in, you will basically see a kind of a zigzag boundaries if you of course, taking a photo by a rotated camera a little bit, right? But this thing is not going to happen inside of final element analysis because inside of each element, you actually introduce a certain level of continuous representation to interpolate what happens in the middle, okay? So that is a very important part of final element analysis. It's not really a so digital signal process. Instead of that, you have those uh, physical laws to supervise how you're able to interpolate things happens inside of each element. That is very important, okay? The other part of a final element analysis, which is very important, is like how you supervise the assembly of these things and how you're able to impose different boundary conditions, just like simply say where you're applying the force and how you apply the force and how big is the force. If it's de deformable objects, which are the parts you lock them, you fix them? Are you allowed them to slide on the ground or just simply fixing one node or something like that? That is called the different boundary conditions. So it's basically, it's a computer program allow you to have this certain level of flexibility to give in the boundary conditions in a way that how you're able to control the simulator, okay? The other thing you're able to control, if you're looking at this mesh, that's the element, right? It's called mesh, okay? And if you say, I would like to give in different Young's modulars. So you, you, I suppose you know what is Young's modulars, okay? And what is the uh, portions ratio? Yeah. Portions ratio. Yeah. Is there any chance you have negative portions ratio in material? What about material itself? Yes or no? Think more carefully. By the way, so that is something you supervise uh, the material distribution. So basically, different material, you have different Young's modulars, you have different portions ratio, right? That's basically giving you the material. So, final element analysis, because you have the elements, you're able to assign different elements, have different materials. That is, gives you the capability to really model multiple material things. If you're working on tissue engineering, trying to, uh, say, produce or design some of the implant, which is able to help you work better if you have the hip joint replaced. And then that's basically the way that how you're able to simulate it. Of course, with the help of the additive manufacturing, you're able to fabricate out, right? So that is a part very important for final element analysis. It's like you have a certain level of flexibility to really control this object in a virtual environment, like how is it able to behave. That's give you the supervision or prediction of the product which you design. So as what I mentioned here, definition of finite element analysis is basically a software and that is giving you a numerical method to really model and solving physical problems in engineering science. And the key concept is about element, is about element equations, it's about how the element equations are assembled together to give you a systematic solution of this very complicated geometry, which is able to be handled because you split the complicated geometry into simple geometry. And then you're able to embed in those physical law on this simple geometry, and with the help of a computer, you're able to assemble these things together to give you the simulation result of complicated geometry. Okay, when I say geometry, I mean both the shape and the structures, okay? So, that is a very important software and uh, computational method that you will need to use in your future career of uh, design manufacturing. So 
let's start from a very simple part of FEA. Let's say, let's say basically you have a real world problem. You can formulate it as a mathematical problem, just like if you have a chart structure, you're trying to uh, calculate what is the stress inside of each chart, and it's uh, safe enough. Okay, so if you're trying to design a bridge, so many of those cases, this is the starting point of the thing. And then, finite element methods basically help you to convert these complicated uh, geometry problems into a linear system. And then you are solving this linear system, you are able to, according, you are able to determine those displacement of every node according to the force which is applied onto this structure. Okay? As long as you know the displacement of every node, so basically you can calculate in, simply you can calculate in the length variation of this truss. Right? If you know the displacement of every node, you know the new coordinate of every node, you're able to calculate in the length change. As long as you are able to calculate in the length change, what are you going to have? The strain. Right? If you have the strain, you can use Young's modular to convert the strain into stress. According to stress, you are able to check in the failure condition. It's like if stress is more than a threshold, the structure is going to be broken. Right? So these are the basic idea of the whole thing. Although I explain it in a very simple way, but the real world is never that simple. But uh, that is a basic simple idea, how this is, helps you to really solve this problem. Right? So, the similar idea applied to both the solid mechanics, the thermal fluid, and also electrical field problem. The other thing is related to how the geometry is changed. Okay? So as long as you're able to building up the connection between the physical boundary conditions and the geometry, you're able to predict how the geometry is going to deform, and according to the geometry deformation, you're able to calculating the physical parameters which you're going to check or you're going to predict in your simulation. So that is the, the basic idea. So different way will lead to different, uh, uh, different physics is going to give you a different way how you're able to formulate this kind of linear system. That's called governing equation, okay? So solid mechanics governing equation, nervous those equation for fluid, and of course, those uh, electrical field problems have another governing equations, which is not going to be covered here, but if you go into different subjects, you're going to have a different governing equations, which can be directly applied here. So in general, as what I mentioned here, final animal analysis is a very general analysis way, or very general method, we are able to predict a different physical phenomenon. So that's a thing which I want to uh, highlight here. And what is the, the process of final animal analysis? Okay. So I guess according to the picture, you're already being able to have a basic sense of what is the process of a final animal analysis. Let's say you design something in solid, you design something in SOLIDWORKS already. So that is a, a geometry description of, uh, of a 3D model, right? So if you go for finite element analysis of your design, the first thing is to generate those elements. So that it goes through the process is like you generate geometry, which is basically you did in Solid, SolidWorks or whatever CAD CAM software. And you have the geometry which gives, gives you the boundary. And then you need to select what is the material I'm going to use for this. Okay, this is going to be a kind of a constant material, or I'm going to apply different material in different regions. So if you're going to apply different material in different regions, so pretty much you need to further refine your uh, geometric design in uh, solid mechanics into, uh, I mean solid works, into different volume. So that's like multiple volume objects. So different volume, you have assigned different material properties. And then after that, you're able to select what is the way to generate elements. So basically, there are 
typically different types of element use. You have tetrahedron shape as element. That is uh, basically using for the linear element analysis. There are some of the hexahedron mesh, which is going to use. That is highly used in nonlinear and finite element analysis and also CFD because it gives you a better way to capture how the physical variables is changed inside of each element because it's highly nonlinear inside. And then if you have a tetrahedron mesh, you only have a four node, which is only giving you the linear interpolation in the middle. So that is basically something I'm, I will try to cover a little bit later how to select a match, what is the current criteria to select a match. But you need to go through this process to select a, a perfect match, to give you the perfect material, correct, appropriate material, and then call the software to help you generate match. Okay? And sometimes the match is not perfect. That happens. Because if you have some match which is not a nearly regular shape, you have a highly collapsed mesh. Think about the things in the middle are kind of interpolated. You need to using a mathematical formula to describe how the things are changing inside. So when you have a collapsed mesh, or you have a extremely stretched mesh, and that's going to give you a highly distorted interpolation inside. So if you stretch the, the picture similarly, okay, I'm not sure how many of you are really a PS, your photo. And uh, that's quite uh, popular in Asian culture. And then uh, everybody send out very nice pictures of yourself. But uh, many of those case photos are kind of a process. If you try to process your face, try to make it slim, and then you have, if you go zoom in, this is some highly distorted thing in the middle, right? So if you have a mesh, which is somehow collapsed or highly stretched, and then interpolation, the physical parameters inside is also highly distorted. That is something we're trying to avoid. So you need to try to select a perfect mesh, if not perfect, and then you need to remesh and try to modify those parameters, trying to get it better. So that's a very important thing. That is all this process. After finish, you have not really started the final element analysis yet because that is called the pre-processing steps. Prepare for the mesh, generate the mesh, prepare the geometry, assign the material properties, and now you are able to start the real simulation, the real uh, uh, prediction. So you define the boundary conditions, you derive those element equations, assemble element equations, into the huge systematic linear equations, and then you are able to solve it in the future, and then that is called the solution part, okay? So after that, you need to somehow review the results. As what I mentioned, usually the result is calculated as a sort of a displacement along the, uh, applied on the nose, but you have not really have any of the physical meaning of the displacement on the node. So that's what I give in the simple example just now. You need to convert the displacement into some meaningful physical thing. That's like convert the displacement into the length variation of the truss, and convert the length variation into the strain, and then convert strain into the stress. So though these are called the post-processing step. Okay? You need to convert these things, and you need to convert the solution of FEA into those meaningful physical parameters so you can make your judgment whether this is a good design or reliable design or not. So that is the whole process while you are trying to implement final element analysis. Okay? So I hope you now have a basic idea of a final element analysis. And I would like to give you a little bit of uh, like review of what we introduced just now by another video. Yes, after I answer your questions. So what's it? Oh, yeah, I, just wanted to remind you that you muted. I just wanted to remind you that you muted the volume earlier. This. Good. Thank you. Uh, 
I should. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Your reminder is really meaningful. How hope this work. The goal of this video is to provide a basic introduction to the idea of what is finite element analysis, or FEA. Welcome to an introduction to finite element analysis. As you can see, this video is going to consist of a bunch of boring PowerPoint slides, going one right after the other. Here's a quick example of a simulation you can run in FEA car running into a wall. Very complex situation, lots of things going on, the loading on individual components is very complex, and yet with an appropriately sized FEA model, you can simulate with a high degree of accuracy what goes on in this event. Let's start off today's topic by taking a little quiz. What exactly is finite element analysis? Is it a graphics tool that can be used to make pretty pictures? Is it a perfect example of if you put garbage into a system, you will get garbage out? Is it a powerful stress analysis tool? It, it, or is it a mathematical tool for solving boundary value problems? Or E, is it all of the above? Okay, keep it in his mind, okay? And then I'll go ahead. So let's talk about what FEA is then. What is the big picture of what goes on? So we'll start out with a complicated problem. For example, here's the Cal Poly Rose Pope float frame. Take this problem and break it into a bunch of smaller pieces. We can manage things in smaller pieces. We can figure out what's going out on in a smaller piece. We're going to call each of those pieces an element. And we're going to limit ourselves to a non-infinite problem. So it's a finite number of elements. There might be hundreds, there might be thousands, there might be millions, but it's a finite number. Then we're going to look at each piece and come up with a very simple description of what's going on in that piece. Oftentimes a linear relationship between stress and strain or between force and displacement. Then we're going to take all of those pieces and show that they have to relate to each other using compatibility or continuity equations. We're going to link them together and this will give us a large system of equations. We're going to so I'd like to pause a little bit here. If you look at the simple, it's already give you some of the hints. Right, the system is kind of uh, the side condition is kind of a forces. That's called it's F. And then the unknown variable is the kind of a displacement. So that's called D. Okay. And then in the middle, the linear system, which is trying to combine to to trying to link the displacement to the force, is the kind of uh, stiffness. Okay, which is called K. K is why is it using K? Because if you look at stiffness of a spring, the, the equation what you use in the spring is using the coefficient K, the symbol K, right? So it's basically, that's the basic idea of a solid, solid mechanics based FEA. So force, displacement, and the stiffness of a system, okay? We're going to so. assemble them into matrix form and get an equation like what's shown here, F equals KD. Then we're going to solve that matrix equation. So the basic idea of FEA is you have an equation where all of the forces equals all of the stiffnesses multiplied by all of the displacements. And you typically know the stiffnesses, because that's your structure, and most of the forces, but you don't know the displacements. So in order to solve the problem, we have to find the inverse of the stiffness matrix K, and that will then give us all of the displacements. So that's the big picture in FEA. So what kind of problems can FEA solve? Well, FEA can solve any kind of boundary value problem, or BVP. A boundary value problem is a mathematical problem in which the quantity of interest is defined by a differential equation that covers it throughout a region. The quantity of interest is only actually known in specific areas called the region's boundaries. And we need to use either the differential equation to determine the value of the quantity of interest internally, or some other method. Some common BVPs in engineering include stress analysis, where we are looking for displacements and stresses internally, but we know displacements and loads externally. Heat transfer, where we know temperature and heat flux on the surface, but we don't know what's going on internally. Or fluid flow, or electrical magnetic potential. All of these can also be considered to be a static or steady state problem, or a time dependent or dynamic sort of problem. 
Let's dive into the finite element process from the user perspective. What do you as the user experience when you are running FEA? So first off, as the user, you need to figure out what you know and what you don't know. This is how you solve any problem. So it's no different with FEA. Define the problem up front. Then create a clean model. So specify the geometry, the material properties, simplify the geometry. And we'll talk more about this and we'll see examples of unsimplified geometry causing problems in FEA. So simplify it, provide material properties. Then define how the model is restrained from motion or restrained from heat transfer conditions or whatever the type of analysis you're doing. Apply the loads to it. In the case of a mechanical system, that's a, a physical force, but loads might be um, heat fluxes in the case of a heat transfer analysis. Then break up the model into pieces. As I said, with the big picture, you want to look at a finite number of elements inside. So here's an example of a finite element mesh on the simple model we started with. Then define how... Sorry, so it's quite annoying. How you're going to analyze it. What is the relevant physics behind the problem? Submit the job to the computer to go solve it using a black box. Now the black box will no longer be a black box after this class, but for an FE analyst, if you trust your code, then it's sending it to the black box to solve it. And then you get the results back, the deformed shape, the this, stresses, this is very important the because you're able to predict the systematic deformation. All kinds of information comes back, and then you need to determine if it is reasonable. You need to go through a post-processing operation. That's an overview of the user perspective. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens once the user submits a job. What is the black box doing? So first off, the computer will identify the element stiffness relationship inside every single element that you have defined. The simple relationship is you've got some forces acting at points on the elements. They are related to the displacements of the same points by stiffness of the element. So F equals KD is the basic equation. You have one of those for every element. So you have 10,000 elements, you have 10,000 matrix equations initially. Then you apply some conditions, we call them continuity equations, that specify that the material doesn't rip or doesn't overlap on itself. These are physical conditions, provided you don't have structural failure. And if we apply them, it allows us to link all of the equations that are in all of the elements. When you link them together, you end up with a single matrix equation, F equals KD. Notice it's all caps now. Then you apply some boundary conditions. So you specify what points are actually known displacements. And when you do that, it, for, for computational reasons, we actually modify the stiffness matrix and the displacement vector and the force vector. So putting the BC for boundary conditions in each of them. We'll talk about this later on in the uh, video series. Then finally, you take the inverse of the KBC matrix and that allows you to come up with a vector of now known displacements. So DBC would be all the known displacements. And then finally you do the post-processing. So you go back to each element, you interpolate local displacements and stresses in them. So this actually, this slide shows a very uh, typical process. No matter what is, what's the problem that you're going to solve, you usually go through this process for the final element analysis. Starting from the element, as was mentioned here, I'm going to use in the spring as an example at a later time of today. And then starting from this, so it's basically the system have many, many of these elements. So basically you're going to assemble this element together, trying to uh, really generate a systematic, uh, like a supervision equation. And then usually this equation is hard to be solved without impose the correct boundary conditions. It comes back a little bit later for, from this video and also my uh, uh, teaching the later time of today. This is called singularity of this uh, linear system because the linear system is a kind of not solvable. Let's simply say this. If you still remember what you learned in your, I, I guess it's from your, uh, uh, A level, it's like further mass is uh, the, what is it called? Full rank of linear system or the full rank of a matrix. If the matrix is not full rank, that means there are some of the, say, vectors are kind of linearly dependent to each other. So it turns out this linear system is not solvable. 
And to make it solvable, you need to impose the proper boundary conditions to make it solvable. So that is something is very essential for solving a linear system or for solving a finite analysis result. And then let's give you those reduced kind of or, or modified assemble system. And then that is something solvable. And using linear system, you linear system solver, you're able to have that. So that is a, give you a very nice summary about the process. We'll practice this uh, process later today by using Spring, okay? Let's go over some basic FEA terminology. We have here a finite element analysis model, and we can identify an element as being a single piece of the structure shown here. Another key term is a node. A node is a point where elements attach or meet each other or on the boundary of an element. Another important term is a boundary condition or a constraint. This is where we specify a known value of a displacement. And then we've got nodal loads. These are forces or other types of loads that are applied to a node. There are some other terms that are going to be important to know. Let's start out with the degree of freedom. A degree of freedom is in the case of stress analysis, simply the displacement of a node. And it's the displacement that is specifically resisted by the elements that the node is attached to. But more generally, you can think of a degree of freedom as some property of a node, like the temperature or the, or the electrical charge, that relates to the attached element stiffness matrix, whatever it is. The next important term would be a nodal displacement vector. This is the, also known as the degree of freedom vector, and it's what I had as a little d or a big D in the earlier slides. The vec this is the vector of all of the degrees of freedoms at that node in the element or the model. So that would be displacement in the x, y, and z direction for a 3D model, or perhaps rotations about certain axes, or perhaps it's temperatures um, for a thermal analysis. Next, the nodal load vector. This corresponds to the displacement vector, and it's the vector of all of the components of the loads at all of the nodes. So if we look at a displacement vector and we have translation in x, y, and z at nodes 1, 2, and 3, then we would have a load vector that corresponds to that, which would be the force in direction x, y, and z, and this um, corresponding to nodes 1, 2, and 3. A stiffness matrix is what relates the displacement vector to the nodal load vector. So the stiffness matrix ha is always a square matrix and it has the number of columns and rows corresponding to the total number of degrees of freedom in the element or in the entire model. So the lowercase, by the way, throughout here are I'm using to indicate the element properties and the uppercase correspond to the whole system properties after we assemble them. A singular matrix is another important concept that we need to have in FEA. This is a matrix that simply cannot be inverted. You can evaluate it by determining the determinant of the matrix, and if the determinant is zero, then the matrix cannot be inverted. But it means something even more important in FEA. It means that there is no unique solution to the system of equations that the matrix represents. That is typically caused by a problem in which you haven't fully tied things down. So if you apply a force to a system and you expect it to be static, but there are improper constraints on the system, then the system will move, or in FEA terms, you will have a singular matrix and you cannot solve the problem. So back to this quiz that I gave you at the beginning. What is FEA? Is it a... So what is FEA? What's your answer? Yes? Sir? Sir? I'm not, you have no idea about age, right? So I think it's a highly, well, there's usually some argument. It's a finite uh, analysis uh, graphical tool to make a perfect picture or not. I still remember the first time when I see the animator Shrek. You remember the, the clothes of the Shrek is kind of, uh, when Shrek is growing up, the clothes of Shrek is, you know, is kind of broken. 
That is a very typical example of how Pixar is using file element analysis to simulate the cloth. And then that is give you some of the answer why A is a kind of a also a correct answer. So basically, FEA is also used as a good graphical tool. Okay? The other example is like many of those PS software, like Photoshop, while you are trying to stretch an image into the way what you want, it's basically all those handles what you use to really stretch and process those photos, the kind of boundary conditions applied to the background mesh which is applied to the image, trying to generate continuous, smooth, and quite a nice picture. Okay? So, fine element analysis cover everywhere, not only physics, but also generally helps you to generate nice graphics. Okay? So I hope I give you the answer now. What is fine element analysis? It's actually all of these above things. So the answer is E. It can be a gra nice graphic tool. It can be a perfect uh, example of a black box function. It's a powerful stress analysis tool, and also in general method for solving volume value problems. Okay, so that is the the basic introduction of a finite element analysis. And for the second part of today, I'm going to use in Spring as an example to explain all these concepts again by details. Great, let's have a break for five minutes now. Thank you.
Testing, testing. Okay. All right. So let's come back to the spring element. Okay. So I, I suppose if you have already watched the pre-lecture video, you know what is spring element. But uh, some of very con key concept I'd like to highlight here again about the spring elements. It's also a core trust element if you extend it into 2D. So here I'm going to cover 1D problem this week. And then next week, we're going to further extend the spring element into the trust element, that is the 2D elements. It's widely used in some of structure analysis. So if you look at the spring, OK, here shows the word spring. I guess you guys were familiar with this spring. Let's assume there's a linear elastic material applied on this spring. So basically, you have the linear relationship between the displacement and the force. So this is called Hooke's law. And that is really the governing equations to supervise the displacement and the force. So you are pretty sure, understand, say, let's say, if the translation of one side, if the other side is kind of fixed, so the translation of the one side is actually the length variation of this spring. Right? If, say, the J node is a uh, displacement for U, and then you have the relationship between the external force P and the U by this P equal to KU, K is the, the stiffness, stiffness coefficients of the spring. Right? So that is the very simple elements. So let's now try to remove the wall. Okay? So if we don't have a war, on the other hand, like we apply another node, we apply another force on the node of I. So basically, you have node I and J are applied. There are two external loads applied there, R and P. If all system need to be, say, in an equilibrium status, so basically P and R adding together should be equal to zero. Right? So, and then we say if both the node i and the node j have a 
displacement. Okay? So we are talking about 1D problem. So both I and J have displacement. So what is the length variation? The length variation right now is uj minus ui. That gives the length change of this spring. Right? So in that sense, this gives you another equation, say p equal to k times uj minus ui. So this is a length variation, length change of the spring. Okay. So far so good, right? Simple. And then let's say apply those equilibrium equation p plus r equal to zero because that is uh, like uh, multiple force applying to the system if the system is in equilibrium is so basically you need to have all these force adding together equal to zero right so and then you give you the relationship between r and p okay so previous slides shows you have this formula already and then you have r equal to minus p so let's say we're trying to subtract, substitute this one into the right-hand side of this formula. So it turns out we have this. R is equal to minus k times uj minus ui. OK? So now you have a two linear system. OK? And with the help of this, so this is actually can be generalized by replace p and r by another symbol. Let's say if the loading applied to node i, we call it pi. If the loading, if the force applied to node j, we call it pj. So it's basically you have pi equal to k times ui minus uj, which is actually derived from the r equation, right? Which is derived from this. Okay, replace r by pi. So basically you have this equation. I replace p by pj, you have this equation. Okay? So this actually giving you just now there's a lot of uh, terminology summarized by the video. We have the nodal displacement, that is the ui and the uj. And we also have the nodal forces, which is pi and the pj. Right? And we have the element stiffness coefficients, that's actually k, right? So now we have uh, this two linear system, and uh, this two linear equation, and then we are trying to make it a matrix, okay? So basically, the first row, I mean this one, is actually this times this, is applied from this equation, right? Right? And then pj is equal to minus k times ui plus k times uj is from this equation. So basically, there's nothing changed. We're just uh, making this uh, two linear system into a matrix form. Okay? And then that gives you this equation. And then that is so called the element stiffness matrix. Okay, so this matrix gives you the element stiffness matrix of a spring element. Of course, for different elements later, you are going to learn like a charge element, that simple one for the simulator. What do you use ANSYS? They have a beam element, they have a general solid element, and they have a shell element, they have different types of elements. So different types of elements, you're going to have a different stiffness matrix, all derived from physical law. Okay, just now we're using the most simple one, the Hooker's law, to derive the element stiffness matrix for the uh, spring elements. Okay, so that's good. Okay, now I'm going to move forward. So let's say if you're looking at a very practical problem, so we say a simple one is it's a toy example, but it's already giving the concept, like the step bar, step the bar, which is have two material. The left material is a steel bar, the right one is aluminum. Okay? So if you have an aluminum bar which is have a different Young's modulus, so we can see like these two bars have a different Young's modulus, they have the same cross section. Okay? So basically A S gives you the the area of a cross section. 
Okay, and then this also gives you the area of cross section. Okay, so they have the same shape of cross section, and then they have the same area. Okay, so if you're trying to convert them into the spring mass, I mean the spring elements, you need to somehow convert the Young's modules area and the length into the K, which we are going to use in for the spring. Okay, so the basic idea or the basic relationship between the uh, spring coefficients and the Young's modulus and the cross section area of this one is actually k equal to ea over by length. Okay, so which is something I'm going to apply here. So basically, you first of all general generalize this problem into the node and element description. So basically, we have a three node. Why we have three nodes? Because we have, need to have one node here. We have one node placed at the interface of two different materials. And then we have the other node placed here. Okay, so we have a node one, two, three, right there. And of course, this is just one way to generate mesh or to generate elements. Of course, you are able to have a better result or a more accurate result if you place another node here, you also place another node in the middle. That is possible. That's a starting from a simple one, two different material, we're just using two elements. Each element have two nodes, so that's why we have three nodes here. And then we have element one, which is describe this part. We have element two, which is gives you this part. Okay, so to all, in order in order to avoid a kind of a confusion in the future, so usually we give an index of a node and also index to the elements. But to make them different, index of element we always adding a circle, okay, to make it uh, distinguish from those uh, nodal index, which is going to be used in the future, okay. So. For K1, that is the, the first element. So you convert, we, are, we need to convert Young's modulus into the coefficients of elasticity of our linear deformation. So let's make it simple, Ea over by the length. So basically, this element have a two meters length. So that is our K1 is equal to 10, power, 10 times 10 power by six Newton per meter, okay? And then the second one, the same, we have uh, E aluminum there, so we apply, <coughs> so we apply the Young's modulus of aluminum here, and we have the length of this uh, element, which is 1.6 meter, and then the same uh, cross-section area. Okay, so we have the two coefficients, so K1 is for element one, K2 is for element two. Okay, so it's all good. Right now, we are able to generate element stiffness matrix. So this is this is the element stiffness matrix we are going to use. So we only have two elements, which is from different materials. So they are going to have different k there, right? So for element one, we are going to substitute k one into this element stiffness matrix. For element two, we're going to substitute K2 into uh, this uh, element stiffness matrix. So basically, that's how we have element one here, and then we have this, okay? So this is for element one. And then we do the same for element two. Okay, so we have these two element stiffness matrix, which is a separated, which is a, a kind of listed in a separated way, right? Okay. So now I'm trying to do, trying to assemble this together into a system. Without loose of generality, we're able to assume that, let's say, what if every node, there's an external force? So we have P1, P2, and P3 apply it to a different node. Although we have no idea about what's the value there. If there's no force there, we just assign them a zero. Right? Okay. So now the thing is like, we could have this, 
load external force at P1, P2, P3. And at the same, what we are going to do is like we are trying to evaluate what is the displacement of node 1, 2, 3. All right? So we have a U1, U2, U3. OK? Now, but here, for every element, you just say Uij. But this Ij is a global index. Right? So Ij means left of element, J of another element, another side of this element. So if we try to apply global index here, what's the meaning of element 1, Pipj? Is it P1 and P2 for element 1, right? So for element, two, uh, for element 1, the U, what is the U, I, U, J here? It's actually U1 and U2, right? Yeah. What about 2? Two? 2 is like P, I, P, J is actually P2 and P3, right? So UI and UJ now becomes U2 and U3. So this gives you already some of the tips, like how they are correlated with each other. Because if you're looking at the first one, which is 1 and 2, 1 and 2, right? But at the end, we're going to have a system which is 3 by 3, OK? So now I'm going to use a visualizer to extend it a little bit. Let's say this one, uh, say. You see here? Yes, OK. So let's say originally we have P, one and P2, which is equal to K1 minus K1 minus K1 and K1. And then the right hand side is U1 and U2, right? Right? Okay. Let's say the focus. This is, this is the original equation. Now we want to extend it into 3 by 3. So it's a possible if we do this, we convert them into P1, P2, and 0, which is equal to K1 minus K1 minus K1 and K1 and U1, U2. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Are they same? Yes. Right? OK. So this is what I did for the first linear system. I would like a bigger error. OK. So on the left and right, you can see the second element. Can we do the same thing for the second element? Yes, we probably can do that, right? So it's basically, the second element, we could say P2, P3, and then we have K2 minus K2 and uh, minus K2 and K2, and then we have U2, U3, and then we are able to further extend them into something like 0, P2, P3, and 0, 0, 0, and 0, K2, minus K2, and minus K2, and K2, uh, 0, sorry, and 0, U2, U3, right? Right? OK. So here gives you what? So basically, the first system actually gives you, say, we could do the thing by giving the index here. So the first one, we say globally, this is index 1 and 2, 1 and 2. 
And then this one globally is index two and three, and two and three. Okay. So when we are trying to assemble them together, basically this kind of index we I, I specified there gives you where this K, K1 or K2 should be insert into the systematic stiffness matrix. Okay. So the systematic the systematic stiffness matrix actually is this one and this one adding together. Okay? Right? So that is gives you what I'm showing here. Here. This is what I say one and two and two and three. Okay, let's come back to this. Still not come back. Come on, come back. Is off? My God, it's. <laughs> Maybe I thought it's a fat finger problem, but I... <laughs> no idea what happens. Shall we? Shall I? Ah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you see, that is, that is... That is a fat finger problem. So it takes time, okay? Uh-huh. Wake up. But anyway, we can continue, right? Let's look at left and right. So to avoid the further yeah, comebacks, great. So that is a that is a global index, right? So now we are trying to add in these two things together. But it's not as simple as you add in two linear systems together. It's definitely like you are trying to assemble this uh elementless stiffness matrix into a uh, System stiffness matrix. So basically, what it did is like you it, you are making you are copy the element stiffness matrix into the global system. So this is somehow comes from D here, but this rather from index gives you where of this is 10 minus 10 minus 10 and 10 is located. So this basically this minus 10 we are located in the second row, the first column. Okay, right. And then these ten will locate in the second row, second column. And what's this five? Where will this five located? The third row, third column, and this minus five, second row, third column. So it's basically all based on this. How are these two and three come from? It's basically where you draw on the picture. Okay, two and three. The good thing is like, if you are a good programmer. You're able to complete all this thing by program, right? As long as you have index given for every node, you store there, so you are able to generate those system stiffness matrix according to nodes index, global index. And where you know where of those coefficients you should insert into those uh, huge linear system. Okay? So that is how we did. And so the first element, after we insert this, and we have a system like this, and then we insert the second elements. So you should put it on top of that. And now, of course, if you have more elements, you can do this one by one, one element by another element. So eventually, after you assemble all those elements, you have a huge linear system. So here, I only introduce elements with three nodes. Later, I'm going to show you some of the animation which is generated for closed simulation. And then those spring numbers could go up to 1 million or sometimes 10 million of elements. So that is still solvable, right? So this is program, programmable thing. So that's what a computer is very good at. 
So now we have a system equation. But if you look at this system equation, there are some very nice properties called 3s uh, three, three, three property. It's symmetric. It's a symmetric matrix. Why is it symmetric? Because element stiffness matrix is always symmetric. Okay, so you have element stiffness matrix is symmetric. Assemble into it, you have symmetric, say, uh, system is stiffness matrix. And then it's a sparse. Why is it called sparse? This is because there are many zeros there. If you go into those uh, linear system with uh, more than, say, 100 and even like a thousand or million of nodes, many of those are case of those elements they give you zero. Why is it zero? Because if you have a linear system which has many of those springs, if we have a node here and node here, there are many other springs in the middle. These two nodes are not directly linked with each other. This is node I and this is node J. The linear system, I mean the the system series matrix element ij will be zero because they are not directly coupled. Okay? So any of those nodes who are not directly coupled, that means there is no element linking these two nodes, the corresponding coefficients will be zero. So you can see that the majority of the elements is zero in the huge linear system. What is the benefit of that? The benefit of that is twofold. One is like if you have a system, which you have linear system, let's say 100 by 100,000, 100,000 by 100,000 linear system, what is the memory you need to store this uh, system? It's like 100,000 times 100,000, right? But what if there are many zeros there? Are you do you really need to store those zeros? No, right? This is just like you compress your photo. You screen capture a photo which is saved as a bitmap, but you save it as JPEG, let's say loosely as JPEG. Does it have a running zero or like a zero lens compression algorithm there, right? So you don't need to store all those zeros. You only need to store, like, starting from this element, all the rest, how many are zeros. That gives you a way to save in memory. So basically, sparse matrix is also stored in this way. So this is one benefit. And not talking about if it's just symmetric, that means what? You only need to store half, right? It further reduces the memory. So that's why the current computer system Although the, comp the memory is already huge, but if we go to the element with the one million element, you still need to apply this technology software, right? The other thing is like for sparse linear system, if you want to try to solve it, uh, how are you solving a linear equation system? Usually three by three or four by four. How you did in your A level? Gaussian enumeration. Right? Ah, yeah, right. Gaussian. Gaussian is everywhere in engineering. So Gaussian emulation is applied there. And then for Gaussian emulation, you need to really eliminate many, many coefficients trying to make it a diagonal or, or, or lower triangle or upper triangle linear system. But what about those zeros? You could quickly skip all those zeros because zero times something still give you zero. That helps you greatly speed up the computation. So basically, the second S and the first S are very helpful thing. Symmetric, sparse, save the memory, and they help you speed up the computation. So that's why linear system or finite analysis with more than one million elements can still achieve the result at a very fast speed. Sometimes with the help of a highly parallel computing of a GPU, you're able to get it in real time, okay? So the third S is a kind of headache problem because it's a, it's a kind of a singular. If you look at this system, why is it singular? Why is it singular? Because you add in the first row, second row, and third row together, you give you a zero. It's a vanished 
kind of uh, linear system. So this is called singularity. So you need to somehow reduce or eliminate this singularity by imposed boundary conditions. Why is it not solvable for this one? Because you give me no idea about whether this system is a static or is moving in a constant speed. Both are equivalent status, right? So that means you want you to you three, no matter whatever the, the answer it is, you can always add in a constant C to give you another answer. So this is, there is no unique answer of this linear system. That's why it's a singular. Okay. So you need to impose some grounded conditions. If you're looking at the previous step the bar problem, just look at this. What is the boundary condition we should apply here? No, the one is fixed on the wall, right? So when no, the one is fixed on the wall, is the displacement is zero. Yes. And then that's why we need to impose the boundary condition, the force, external force, what we applied here. If you look at this picture, so we have P3 equal to QKN. P2 equal to minus 1kn, okay? So we need to give you a unique axial direction. And then what is the P1? No idea. Yes? Exactly nothing. Yep, P1 is zero. There are no forces here. Are you sure? I'm not sure. Okay. How about the others? Do you think P1 is zero? Why P1 is not zero? Or, or tell me, what is P1? Oh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, it's hard to say. So if it's a rigid body, you can give me the answer immediately. Right? If it's rigid body, you have a P1 plus P2 plus P3 equal to zero. Okay? But if you're not, it's not a rigid body, I suggest you calculating it by using the linear system, which we derived just now. But at the end, you, you'll still find it's, uh, it's the answer what you mentioned, just like uh, minus one kn, because it's, linear, it's a linear elasticity system there. But in general, may not. Okay, it so all depends on what is the u you applied there, okay? There are some boundary condition you allow you want to have a certain level of movement. Say, if you have some buffer there, okay, it's not fixed. If you want is fixed, zero. Okay? So let's come back to how we calculate it. The first thing we need to do, let's say, let's really identify what are the boundary conditions we already know. U1, zero. P2 minus 1 kn, P3 2 kn, right? Okay. So let's try to impose this onto this linear system. So that means we know the value of P2 and P3. We know the value of U1. Okay. So that's how we have this, because this is zero. That means we have zero times minus 10 is zero. Zero times zero is zero. So that means if you are trying to solve in the system, we are really trying to solve a kind of so-called reduced linear system by imposed boundary conditions. So it turns out this linear system become a linear system like this, right? Okay, and then that is a full rank linear system. It's not a singular animal, so it's a solvable. So with the help of this, we determine the value of U2 and U3. So that's the one. And what is really P1? P1 is actually equal to this one times this. You can verify what is uh, 
whether it's a minus one kn or not? The answer is yes. But you should derive the value of P1 by applying this linear system. Okay? So, giving you a bounding condition at one node, at zero, is a still a special case. What about, so this is P1, right? So what about if U1 is not a zero? How are you going to do? Just what I mentioned, like U1 allow a certain displacement, and I find that is, for example, if the wall itself is a kind of like this, soft. So you attach something on the wall soft. But what you know is like you can measure the displacement. You know U1. You measure the, U, the displacement and know the 1, but it's not 0. Yes? Kind of, yes, that's the answer. Let me, let me explain on the board. Oh, I hate this, so kind of. Can I, can I switch coil back? I hope I can call it back. Three, two, yes. <laughs> so let's say, okay. Let's say if we have this linear system, well, which is shown on the, on the left and right. So we have this 10 minus 10. Now we know, say, u1 is a constant c, right? It's not 0 anymore. And we have u2, u3 equal to, say, p1 and minus 1, 2. Okay, that's now, we're trying to solve this. The very simple thing is like, we still solve it in the way like we're solving the bottom two. <coughs> I already substitute C, because C is a known value now. It's a constant. We just substitute it into it. And then that means minus 10C. Are we able to move it to the right-hand side? Yes, right? So basically, the second row of the system is this one times this equal to minus 1. So this is converted into, say, 15 minus 5, say u2 equal to minus 1 plus 10c, right? Right, so it's still this one times this one equal to this. So it becomes this one times this one, u3, of course, equal to this. The only thing I want to do is moving minus 10 times c to the right hand side. c is known and constant, right? I see quite a few confused faces. You, did you get it? Yes. How about others? Any, anyone still cannot get it? Well, this one, let me repeat, okay? This one times this equal to 1. That is gives what? Minus 10c plus 15u2 plus minus 5u, uh, sorry, 3. u3 equal to minus 1, right? And is this equal to 15u2 minus 5u3 equal to minus, equal to minus 1 plus 10c? Yes, right? Now you got it. Okay, good. So this is how this one and this one comes from. Okay? We can do the same thing for the third row. This one times this equal to 2. So that gives you what? 
minus 5, 5, and 2, and plus 0 times c, right? Right? OK. So 0, OK, it's not u. OK. So that is the, that is the question. In general, what if u1 is not 0? OK. So, but what if the third question, if we say, again, still this is a linear system, OK? But this time, u1 is not known. But we fix the middle one, the middle point. And that means this one becomes 0, right? Right. So are you still able to solve it? The same, right? So if this happens, oh, I'm using another paper, trying to avoid further confusion. So if this happens, and we are trying to convert the first row into, say, 10, 10 from here, and 0, 0 from here. And then minus 10 times 0, we move into the right-hand side, right? So this is the first row times u1, u3, equal to, let's say, p1, right? OK? And the third row becomes this one times this equal to 2. So again, so we have a 0 and a 5 times, so minus 5 times 0 moved to the right become 2, right? So this system is still solvable, right? Although it's a diagonal system, but it's a full rank, right? Okay, so this actually gives you the answer for the third question. Okay, what if u2 is set at 0? So no matter how you impose the boundary condition, what you did is like substitute the value of a boundary condition into the system and moving all those known values to the right-hand side, and then you're able to have the solution. That's the general way to impose uh, boundary conditions. Now come back. Yes. Okay. So. What about this? In general, more elements. I think this is the same as what we did just now, right? The only difference is like you have more and more elements. But the whole routine is the same. If I ask you to calculate it by hand, you will feel, wow, that's too tedious. I may have made some of a careless mistake. But what if it's uh, solving by the program, if you write in some MATLAB code to solve it? It's always possible, right? No matter how complicated, you do the same thing all the time. So finite element analysis is actually a routine work. So that's why it's called it's a programmable, OK? So we do this, and then we say this is the, OK, I, I, I quickly jump to the answer. So this is the linear stiffness matrix. You can realize like it's actually a sample of element one and element two, element three, and element four, right? So it's a sample of element one, two, three, four. And then of course, the external loading, we know that P and R, we have no idea about what's the value of in the middle because this is fixed. We only, the only con boundary condition you know is like its displacement is zero. You have no idea about what is this is a fixed pin. What is the force given to the system by this fixed pin? It really depends on the final result to obtain the displacement, and then you can calculate what is the force there. Okay? So, and then you impose this boundary condition, that means this row and this column are kind of eliminated. Now you have a reduced linear system, which is full rank, which is solvable, and then we're able to use in MATLAB to solve it. Okay, so here, almost the end of today's uh, lecture, I'll give you a few things. 
The first is like uh, share some of the animation which is generated by Spring Element System. Okay, so I, I suddenly jump. Hey fellow scholars, uh, this is I, to what that means. I am I just uh, matters. But first, for concrete. I just uh, randomly uh, jump into some simulation results. So you realize like how complicated the scenario could be if you simply just simply using springs. So you are able to simulate a kind of a young and how this spring uh, uh, interact with each other. And if you're looking at uh, 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 some of the animation movies from Pixar, you realize like that is a fun element of things at the back to support the generation of this sort of animations. Okay, so uh, some of uh, I see this. You see the elements there. So basically, the how the things are simulated, the elasticity, boundary conditions. Okay. So I leave a link uh, on the course notes. You can try to watch it after lecture. So that's it. And then before the end of today's uh, uh, lecture, I would like to highlight a few so-called home homework. I will not check it. You, j you are not uh, asked to submit it, but just for your own practice, I wish you could go back to really finish all this by yourself. So there is a, a kind of uh, uh, FEA lab sheet, which is really for you to really practice, to download the software, to practice a little bit thing, to watch the video, and also uh, a kind of MCQ, just for you to really uh, kind of re re revision of uh, what we learned today, right? And the other thing is like trying to watch the pre-lecture video before we come to lecture next week. And then this is the lab sheet of uh, today. So you are doing some a little bit of hand calculation, do a little bit about lab calculation, uh, my lab calculation of uh, solving leading systems. And this is some of spring examples. Try to use my lab to solve it and to see how you could uh, get in the, the result. So yes, that's uh, all about the so-called homework, which I expect you can finish before you come to uh, the lecture next week. So any questions? If no questions, I, I hope I can still see the same group of students <laughs> next week. Don't be disappear. Okay, so although it's a recorded, I have no idea how reliable this recording is. So I hope you feel like uh, this two hours is not wasting your time. All right. Thank you very much. See you next week. See you. Section. Okay, good luck. <laughs> so it was your first lecture as well. Yeah, yeah, first lecture this uh, year. Okay. So, so how's everything done. good? The proposal submitted? Yeah, it's submitted. Okay, it's a very good proposal. I, I mean, thank hope you it can be it can be supported. I hope so. Right, but, so. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your help. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So they are supportive. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. So see you uh, Charlie, I was going to email you about one other thing, but yeah. uh, just maybe I can mention now quickly. Yes. Yeah. So. For international collaborations, uh, next month or this month, I'm going to visit Turkey with a very good university. Yeah. And the key topics are about composite materials, manufacturing and robotics, yeah. because they have a good robotics yeah. background as well. Yeah. And I want to help present them. You need a video for me. That would be really great. Okay. I, I can send you a link. 
Yeah, yeah, so we put it on YouTube. We just uh, insert the YouTube link there. Thank you very much. Thank That will be great. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes, yes.